bit. Um, and the first one for the afternoon session is um, Tricia Meyer. Um, as you can see from her bio in the booklet, um, her research focuses on the social impact of technology with a particular emphasis on the regulation of disinformation. In a paper she wrote recently with one of her colleagues, um, she makes the following point, and I quote, over time, AI solutions to detect and remove illegal or undesirable content have become more effective, but they also raise questions about who is the judge in determining what is legal, illegal, and desirable, undesirable in society. Underlying AI use is a difficult choice between different elements of law and technology, public and private solutions, with trade-offs between judicial decision-making, scalability, and impact on users' freedom of expression. Um, absolutely. And uh, these are precisely the sorts of issues that we've already started addressing today. So it's um, entirely appropriate that you're here to talk to us about them. So thank you. Thank you, Marcus. I don't think I gave you that quote. I no. think you... Uh, <laughs> I, I happened to write that one. It wasn't my co-author. It was me. <laughs> um, it's my pleasure really to be in Cambridge with you today. And to... Um, my presentation is based on a study that I did with Chris Marsden, who's a, a uh, legal scholar, I'm a media scholar, with a lot of input from someone who was then working for the UK government, for DCMS, uh, and didn't feel that it would be appropriate to be a co-author, but certainly provided a lot of input, Ian Brown, who's a computer scientist. Uh, so we tried to embody what I see that uh, Crash also aims for, to have a very interdisciplinary uh, perspective, because we believe that that also is necessary to approach this from different disciplinary, but often different uh, sets of language, knowledge, theories, literature, etc., to get a, 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 an in-depth understanding and hopefully to make sense of some of the challenges that we, that, that we are facing. This study was conducted for the European Parliament at the request of MEPs from a variety of different political parties who realized that we're moving. We're moving with artificial intelligence. And it was kind of mapped on the challenge at the time when, the, when we were requested to do the study. Uh, now it came out in, uh, in early spring of the European elections and the realization. I'm going to close this because I'm going to keep trying to move the presentation based on my, my computer of, well, let's go back to Cambridge Analytica, but also the realization that there is, so foreign interference, whether we're talking about uh, the Leave campaign or whether we're talking about US elections or certainly um, attempts that have been made in different national jurisdictions as well. Um, so it came from a, a background of thinking of election integrity, uh, but certainly spans uh, across the issues that we've been, been covering today as well. How did we define or how do we build on the existing knowledge that there is of disinformation? So for those who are perhaps a little bit less familiar with this background and context, uh, uh, last year, so in 2018, the European uh, Union, the Commission in particular, set up a high-level expert group to start looking at the uh, issues of disinformation. This high-level expert expert group was very multi-stakeholder, so, so coming from various sectors, uh, certainly not only tech, but very strong civil society and media representatives, uh, rep representatives as well. Um, and the definition that they proposed is one where they tried to disambiguate with misinformation, malinformation, tried to avoid the, the use of the word fake news, uh, even though that has a lot of salience, and to to kind of zoom in on false, inaccurate, or misleading information that is designed, presented, and promoted to intentionally cause public harm or for profit. So here you can see how that focus was in part on the elections, uh, but also it can be advertising practices where you simply are doing it because you know it generates uh, uh, generates uh, traffic, uh, and you can benefit from that from, from an advertising perspective as well. Uh, and so trying to distinguish uh, from misinformation where you can have uh, unintentionally false or in uh, inaccurate information, we can simply be misinformed, right? And that's okay. We're not perfect. 
Uh, but there is something behind the motivation of why we are sharing things. Um, and often there's political economic interests underlying. So what did we do? Uh, it was, we were asked to do a literature uh, review. There's a lot of scoping exercises uh, ongoing now. Uh, and there certainly is a lot of literature already out there. <laughs> uh, our study added to that, and in particular, our focus then was on looking at the consequences of uh, using artificial intelligence, so our automated um, uh, processes to deal with disinformation and the impact that it can have on media pluralism and on freedom of, of expression. Uh, so, so zooming in from simply mapping things to realizing, okay, these actions are already ongoing, what can we say uh, are the consequences? Perhaps it's good, we don't want this content out there, but at the same time, what does it mean for perhaps marginalized or slightly more radical views that we do believe they should Freedom of expression is there also, or per perhaps particularly for those whose views perhaps are a little bit different, right? And how did we then, we called it in the study artificial intelligence, but I feel like we are doing a, a great dishonor to, to the concept also in this, in this content. We, we had a bit more of a, a modest view in, in, uh, as a way of what we meant with that, which is thinking of the tech platforms in particular, which we were analyzing, and their processes for automatically detecting content, recognizing it, but also taking action on it. It can be a detection that then goes on to human review, or it might be in the case of fake accounts, bot accounts, for instance, that they are automatically taken down. Or it could be filtering. You upload content that is recognized as being terrorist content or is recognized as being copyright infringing, some element of disinformation, and you simply are stopped. I think people, perhaps, if they've uh, 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 been creators on YouTube, have had that issue as well, right? That you have databases underlying, whether that's content or D or hash technologies, that help with the detection of content that is deemed illegal, controversial for some reason, uh, and that you are stopped from actually sharing that. Um, so what's important to realize is that often there are humans still involved, uh, so it's more about assisting human judgment, uh, but there certainly are circumstances where we know some of the examples that I just gave of where it is automated the whole way through, right? From the detection to the blocking, the filtering, the takedown, the deprioritization of content that happens through algorithms. And we think there's something to say about actually knowing how that happens. Why? <laughs> uh, because we know, and as you know, that there's overblocking and underblocking. So ACR, automated content recognition technologies, are prone to false negatives and false positives. With that, we mean that there's a lot of things that are thrown in there. Uh, there's the famous example of the nude girl who was fleeing uh, 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 during the Vietnam War that was taken down by Facebook because it showed nudity of a, uh, of a minor. Um, although you recognize that there, there's value to there. There's a societal discussion. There's a context behind that. that warrants that you might be able to show that image, despite it being a nude minor, uh, right? Or similarly, that statues, ancient statues that are also being taken down because the, the technology simply can't detect that you're dealing with an, a very old statue and not with nudity, right? Um, so we're not there yet, right? And that's the point. That uh, we notice that it's very difficult to detect. Uh, it might be uh, more easier to detect terrorist content or copyrighted content that is already in these databases, that it's been recognized as being uh, either something that you don't want to uh, share or belonging to another uh, 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 creator, an another rights holder. Um, but when we're dealing with the issues that disinformation often are dealing, uh, is dealing with election integrity, hate speech, etc., this can be far more difficult, right? Uh, especially if you're thinking of political speech, um, who you give voice and who you don't give voice uh, matters greatly. Zuckerberg. Um, Facebook is an interesting example where on the one hand, uh, uh, they, they seem to portray that they have 
a lot of knowledge and AI is going to help solve things, but at the same time, there's a strong recognition that technology companies, something that I welcome, shouldn't be solving this on their own. Uh, that private companies set up with uh, corporate interests uh, in mind perhaps are not the best place to making decisions on what is disinformation what and what is not, what is political speech, what is not, what is copyrighted content, what is not, etc. Um, so a recognition of Zuckerberg uh, uh, himself that um, AI, that some types of uh, uh, harmful content um, is easier to detect than others. <coughs> what I'll be doing in the following 10 minutes or so is kind of getting some indications of where we believe that the discussion should go to. I'm not going to present the, the, the analysis of these various platforms, but I very much uh, am willing to dig into some of those, those findings or the, the research, the analysis underlying it, uh, but focus more on what we, what we then recommend, uh, what we told the European politicians that they might want to consider. Um, and this is the premises, where we started from um, and which we think should be put forward in every <laughs> single policy discussion. Don't trust the technology. The technology is biased. It simply it reflects the technological choices, the choices in terms of values, ethics, etc., that we are building into the system. Uh, these platforms weren't built uh, necessarily to promote uh, respectable, uh, kind content. Uh, they were built in a way that to encourage interaction, but not necessarily positive interaction. Uh, they were built to have a system where the user does not have to pay for it, but you need an advertising model underlying it. That's how they gain profit. That's how they can build on it. And to recognize that that comes with choices, that that comes with things that they will prioritize in terms of um, ensuring that uh, uh, they are a platform that is attractive to all. But it will also have a consequence in terms of how they design their technologies. So it's better for the platforms to overblock than to underblock. Uh, it is better for them to, uh, uh, pardon my, my, my French as we would say, uh, cover their ass um, and ensure that they don't get, uh, uh, that they aren't asked to do more and therefore automated technologies can be quite attractive. But what's not attractive is to open up your box, to say how you're doing things. It's better to simply give it a cover of a little AI sauce, it's all fine, rather than uh, being enabling to have appeal and oversight mechanisms in order to ensure that you're minimizing inevitable inaccuracies. And in particular, another value, if we're saying technology has a value, has design choices in it, and therefore you have to th think of the values that you're portraying. Another aspect of this is in terms of legislation that we wanted to make a very strong stance in indicating that we believe that you need to, you cannot treat these technologies, these companies, as being the judge. Uh, that's not something that I think we should be uh, furthering in society. Um, and therefore, we have to think of the fact that restrictions to freedom of expression should be provided by law, legitimate, proven necessary, and the least restrictive harm to pursue the aim, right? To build this consistently and, and to think through each point. Uh, is it proven necessary? Is it the least restrictive uh, means to pursue the aim? Or should we rather be focusing on, on something else? kind of had indicated this already, but they are, so they're limited in their accuracy. Context and cultural cues often are necessary. You need a lot of linguistic skills as well to understand uh, what, is, what is ongoing. If we're thinking of these companies, they're American companies across it, uh, operating worldwide. Uh, the situation in Bangladesh and India is very different than it is here, right? Uh, so, and think those are, relatively large linguistic groups, but what about the smaller ones, right? Uh, and how is the perception or is the experience of the individual internet user uh, different across the world? This matches a little bit. Uh, the next two slides are, are reflecting uh, on 
what type of regulatory response would be possible. What we notice now is that there's voluntary compliance and self-regulation. In the context of the EU, there was a code of uh, practice passed, uh, especially in the context of the elections. And here it is some sense of reporting of audit, but along own standards of the platforms. What we he, what I heard this morning uh, on the, the UK white paper is thinking more towards, it certainly is co-regulation. Um, and in the next slide, I'll show you in terms of reflecting, sorry, this is actually the inverse of the pyramid that you saw, where statutory regulation is on the bottom. But it's thinking very much of developing standards, developing codes of practice that are industry-wide, um, but where you have strong, uh, strong backing, a bit of a stick uh, that, you, that, you, that you have in place. Well, currently what we notice is that we're more towards, towards the top, a lot more of the fluffy stuff, uh, um, where there's a lot of room for maneuver. And I'm not saying, uh, my talk might seem that I'm very anti-corporate, very anti-tech. Uh, that's not the point. I, uh, it's not the case. And I think the point here is we need to be working together on things. There's no point in trying to uh, create uh, animosities, uh, but rather to recognize that everyone is operating, in most cases, under their own interests. Uh, and to recognize those interests uh, and to be explicit about them and to see what type of public values that we want to and that we want to build in. Um, I'm a media scholar. Some of the background of what I'm coming at is recognizing that I think we're at, a, at, a, at a, a, an era of change, right? Where if you can think uh, back to, it's before my time, but uh, television, radio, etc., in the values that have been embedded in them, that we are similarly having a discussion about what type of values do we want to be building into these tech platforms because they are the places where uh, speeches are happening. This is how we are more and more becoming informed about world affairs, etc., right? To reflect on them not as being identical to those uh, media organizations, but having certain responsibilities that come with being uh, the great and mighty of this day. So, what were our five concrete, uh, no, we didn't call them recommendations. They were supposed to be options, policy options. Um, because apparently giving a recommendation didn't, uh, didn't suit is too, is too binding. Policy options is what I should say. But five, five principles that we believe uh, should, should be uh, considered. First of all, look at the broader picture. Look at it from a, a disinformation in particular, from a broader lens and recognize that this isn't just about tech platforms, right? That this is about a crisis in the trust in politics, in society, in media. And in particular, that the media organizations are going through a great amount of change uh, where they are competing with a lot of free content, a lot of content that is uh, at, at certain points also simply generated. And underlying uh, uh, or parallel to that, you have an advertising revenue, a business model for media organizations that has been completely undermined. Um, where it's often these same platforms that uh, are, have taken a lot of the advertising revenues, but there's a certain, not to say that we should protect and we should coddle media organizations, but that there is um, something to say for trustworthy media and supporting them in their efforts, right? And here what this might result in is that instead of deprioritizing disinformation, that you have trust standards, right? You have trust indicators that are being developed by media organizations of indicating, look, this is content which we think is actually good. Let's give you something from the left and from the right side of the spectrum uh, using source transparency indicators rather than deprioritizing content. Or as YouTube already does, of having a Keras wheel if you're searching for uh, uh, for particular media content, that they'll give you certain organizations uh, which they know, um, per perhaps not that particular piece of content, but they know overall that media organization is adhering to, to st quality standards for journalism, right? And giving users the opportunity to really understand how their search results, their media feeds, are built, if possible, to make changes. Twitter, for instance, you can turn off the algorithm so that you can see how uh, content might appear if they're not prioritizing it for you. Secondly, 
<laughs> we all can say this, right? Facilitating independent evidence and research. It's a black box. We don't know what's going on. We don't know why content is being taken down. Uh, we don't know what the reasons are underlying it. What are the terms and conditions that were, that were breached? What is the legislation that this is in violation of? Um, how do we actually, how do these uh, automated content recognition technologies actually work in practice? Ensuring that there is human review and appeal processes when it does happen. We want to be, we want to make use of automated technologies, but there needs to be, in all circumstances, uh, a possibility to review, to appeal. Some of the platforms are good at doing this. Others, I won't mention which one, um, um, only offers opportunities in certain circumstances, right? And why is this, again, recognizing that technology isn't neutral and that we should be keeping human uh, oversight. Two last points. We notice that the appeal mechanisms, that the notice and uh, the, the terms and conditions, that the notices and appeals, that the reporting uh, is different across the industry. I think it's time to move beyond that. Um, the Santa Clara principles that have been developed, I think, are a very nice example of how that can be done of ensuring that you actually are being transparent. Transparency isn't enough because it all depends what's behind it. Um, but at the, at, as was mentioned, if you're transparent, this might lead to higher standards. This might lead to you actually changing the processes that are underlying it uh, because at least it's known what you're doing. And then finally, uh, something that resonates with what was said this morning, I think as well, is that we need something that goes across. Um, so an industry-wide uh, code, sure, um, but then there likely needs to be an involvement of a co-regulator, of independent, uh, an independent authority that ensures that things are actually, that there's a stick, right? That things actually happen. And I would add, in particular, one that's multi-stakeholder because we're dealing with issues that are across uh, that have need multiple solutions that go across sectors. Um, a multi-stakeholder body can give an understanding of how this is experienced by civil society, by consumers, by citizens, how this is experienced by media organizations. Um, tech comes, so not simply having an arrangement between tech companies and government, um, but rather to have uh, a system that ensures that concerns from uh, multiple sectors in society are, are dealt with. And mainly what is, what, is, what is the aim here is that we are enabling the technology, that we are using it for good, uh, but in particular that we're building in certain values, ethical values that we believe uh, are important to move forward. Uh, so again, I'll use this analogy of uh, the tech companies kind of being those new, uh, those new broadcasters, uh, right? Uh, and ensuring that we are um, having them adhere to similar standards to which we believe were important in the past as well. I'm very, um, this is the end of it, sorry. <laughs> Unless you want to um, um, read the study, I made a tiny URL for you. It's about 100 pages, it's digestible, I promise. Um, but yeah, very happy to also link this into further into the discussions that we've been having, having today. Marcus, I'd perhaps say I um, so I'm teaching a media program. I teach a course that was traditionally only about media law. I brought in media ethics. So I have a similar effort to what you were saying of recognizing the importance of understanding the values that we're building on in order to understand the legislation or the de design choices that we're making. Yes.